Good evening, everyone. My name is Ken Hausman. And as described earlier by Karina, I work with Microsoft. I'm a technology solutions professional. And basically what that means is I'm dedicated to the uh, federal space to assist, essentially just go out and assist customers, partners, and other vendors with uh, deploying solutions within the field. So it was about a year or so ago that I was actually here with Steve Michelotti, one of our other Azure engineering reps. And uh, we did a session on cognitive services and went through a couple of other things related to AI, machine learning, and whatnot. And I'm just glad to see that you know we're really picking up the traction and you know continuing to drive uh, within this environment here. So you know, there's been, obviously just been a lot of changes. You know, some of us are even still working in spaces where you know we're still running mainframes, and you know, we haven't even begun to make that transition from you know, say, mainframes to PCs, PCs to web, and web to mobile, for instance. And obviously, there's just a lot of stuff going on there. But really, you know, autonomy and artificial intelligence here is going to be the next big wave, and we really need to get educated, trained, and then uh, begin operating in this space as well. So you know, every time that there's been a, a big innovation and a big change between you know, these different environments that we've had in the past, there's always been a, so a little bit of a displacement of jobs. But you know, with that also comes a lot of capabilities for innovation and new ways that we can do things. I mean, just think of the way that uh, Uber has really just transformed the transportation industry. Or think of the way that mobile has transformed even just the restaurant industry here in the last couple of uh, years itself. You know, you can now just pick up a mobile and order a, a meal and just have it delivered to you from nearly any restaurant. So obviously there are a lot of changes, a lot of things going on in this industry, and artificial intelligence and autonomy is really going to make a big impact on the way that government is going to operate here in the next couple of years. And you know, I was just really glad to hear that you know the previous speaker was hitting on a lot of this material and just talking about you know some of the waves of things that I'm going to be talking about within this slide deck here. So just to give you a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about, I'm just going to you know, cover very quickly some of the artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities that we have within Azure and the platform itself. And uh, then I'm going to jump into two very quick demos related to translator and custom speech service in addition to custom vision service. And the reason I pulled these out is because it somewhat relates to uh, some of the customer success stories that I might talk about here in a few minutes. And uh, then lastly, I just want to briefly slide up here uh, some information about learning opportunities as well. You know, how you can get trained up on this material, different advantages that you have that are free, open source, and uh, things that you can even do just directly from your work desk, hopefully. So in the previous presentation, we also had a slide deck that you know, briefly talked about some of the services, some of the AI ML. And you know, before we even go down that path, what I really wanted to talk about very briefly was just showing how you know a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about right now are right within this platform as a service realm, and what that means is you know we're not managing operating systems, patching, we're not worrying too much about security things like that. A lot of that is already being uh, taken care of by just basic level controls that are available within Azure itself. You know you don't have to be a machine learning expert to be able to deploy something. You know you can literally just in some of these instances that I'm going to show you, just connect to an API, use some data that you already have, and then spin up some uh, potentially useful things that you can bake into existing applications and workflows, which I'll show you here in a second. So as you can see, Azure brings a lot to the table in terms of capabilities. We have all sorts of things that allow us to perform everything from information management all the way over to intelligence, visualization, and different types of capabilities. And then, you know, today, what we really want to focus in on are some of the other tools that we can use within this AI stack as well to be able to integrate tools, workflows, and data processing to really get at uh, some of these capabilities. So like I had mentioned, what I'm going to do is jump out of this and then just go over to uh, Internet Explorer and then just jump through some of the Cognitive Services APIs. The reason I like to start here is because this is just something that's very easy to get customers spun up on. You know, it doesn't take a, a data scientist to be able to spin up uh, different machine learning models. You know, we don't need access to a lot of data in many cases. You know, we can do all sorts of things like we had just described in this last uh, brief session, everything from translation, transcription, object detection, vision, that type of stuff.
So like I had mentioned, I like to start with cognitive services because there are nearly 30 different capabilities, APIs that you can literally just plug into. They perform all sorts of different capabilities from, like I said, language translation, object detection, to even assisting with mapping and things like that. So one of the ones that I really want to hit on here is translator. And the reason I bring this up is because, oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were on duplicate screen. I appreciate that. The reason I like to bring up Translator is because we've seen this being active in a lot of the federal space as well as the civilian space as well. Um, one of the big reasons is, is because we have just a lot of customers that deal with everything from call center scenarios to interviews and you know, even you know, organizations that operate internationally as well. You know, there's just a lot of different languages across the globe, and this is one of those APIs that has really helped some of our federal customers as well to interact as well as do things like transcribe, translate, and document a lot of that material that's being, that's occurring right now. And you know, it, like I said earlier, it's not really about replacing jobs, it's about augmenting jobs as well. You know, we don't necessarily always have to pick up a phone and talk to a human translator. We can easily just call an API and do the very same thing. But in many instances, Translator doesn't always you know, suit the needs for every particular customer out there. You know, in every particular industry, there's typically a lot of domain-specific knowledge, um, keywords, uh, vocabulary, or locations, places, names, things like that that may not be picked up by Translator itself. And a lot of that just goes back to the way that the Translator API itself is trained. It's done so on commercially available data sets. But, you know, we also make this other capability called custom speech service that allows us to do two really cool things. One, we can take um, existing audio and filter out human speech from background noise with this. Essentially what we can do is create an acoustic model. So think of the scenario where, you know, you're driving up through a drive through you have a lot of background noise that's occurring, you know, horn honking, different things going on around the vehicle itself. But, you know, say like you're trying to uh, speak into a, a drive through kiosk, for instance, you know, you need be able to be able to separate out that human speech from that background noise. So this is one of the things that the custom speech service is really good at doing. Um, and then it allows you to get into that uh, human speech model as well. The second thing that you can do with this API is that you can, like I described earlier, take custom keywords, vocabulary, et cetera, and create your own language models so that you can more quickly pick up speech um, and accurately as well. So you can see here from this particular um, site, this API that I have created a deployment, um, what I have done is taken just a bunch of transcripts from a open source biology data set. You can see that a lot of the keywords here are pretty complex, the crustaceous era, Tyrannosaurus, and some of the other words that you'll notice up here on the screen itself. Like I had mentioned earlier, whenever you're running this through Translator API, there's going to be a lot of errors that you would typically pick up for some of these very specific keywords. But like I had alluded to, we can create a custom deployment, an API endpoint that we can connect to, train a language model, and then be able to do all sorts of things from being able to track accuracy of how this endpoint has been deployed and how those transcripts that I had, along with the accompanying data sets, the language itself, performs. As you can see here, we got it down to about a 3% word error rate, which is pretty amazing. And uh, from there, I got mentioned 3% word error rate. And uh, one of the other things that I wanted to show you real quick was this application that I have spun up. Basically what it's going to do is perform a side-by-side -side comparison of some audio that I am passing in, just a, a standard data set. Looks like it was closed out, so I just need one second to quickly pull up a file. So what I'm going to do is just pass this audio file directly over to this endpoint. And what it's actually doing is uh, passing it directly into both the Bing Speech API in addition to the custom speech service endpoint that I had just deployed. And as long as I have a good Wi-Fi connection here, what you're going to see 
is that we uh, passed back a lot of good information here about the way that the data was returned. Um, we have a very high confidence score that Noahsaurus lived in the Crustaceous period. And you can also see the accompanying text over on the Bing speech side as well, where you know there were some ac inac sorry, inaccurate results returned. And you can see the confidence scores as well as the stack ranking of what it actually thought it was. I literally passed in no more than 50 phrases along with accompanying uh, transcriptions of what was being said and then was able to get, like I said, basically a 97% accuracy. You know, AI is not about replacing humans. Again, it is about augmenting the way that we do our jobs. It's about helping us do things faster, better. And again, you know, we've seen this being used across call centers and a lot of other really cool scenarios in the federal space as well. And then like we had briefly described as well earlier, we have this uh, computer vision API and what this allows us to do is to pick apart objects. It allows us to look into all sorts of different information about the tags of information that are being displayed. It provides a uh, returned sentence along with an accompanying confidence score of what the API actually thinks. Um, is occurring within the picture use itself. So you can see we have train, station, different things like that. Um, it pieces all that information together. For instance, you know, if I click on this picture here, we're able to pull in information about skyscraper, the confidence levels, and uh, basically it just gives you information about a black and white photo of a city here in this particular uh, return text with a very high confidence score. But there are all sorts of other different things that we can do as well, um, such as OCR with this particular API. Or even recognizing handwritten text as well in English. And a lot of different things, but not every scenario is ideal for this particular API. Again, there are certain niche scenarios where we need to be able to uh, recognize custom objects. You know, we might not be able to uh, say that we need to recognize a vehicle, but maybe we want to be able to recognize a, a Hyundai from a pickup truck or something to that effect, or to be able to recognize one type of weapon from another, that type of thing. So what I've done here is very quickly just added a bunch of uh, very generic photos. Um, you can see here that I have pictures of pens, oranges, apples, etc. You know, there's nothing uh, too unique about uh, what I am showing you up here on the screen, but what I can also do is then go over to uh, predictions. I can even perform quick tests and basically test out how well this had operated. Um, this isn't what I really want to be able to focus on because there are niche scenarios where we need to be able to take these models that we're creating and then deploy them to the edge to be able to operate in the field in disconnected scenarios. So what you can actually do with this particular API, if you're not aware, the custom vision service allows you to also export some of these, mod some of these uh, pieces of information into, like we see here, TensorFlow models. What I've also done is taken this TensorFlow model and then deployed this to my Android phone as well. So in a disconnected scenario, I can take this train model and be able to recognize, in this instance, pens from oranges, from apples, things like that, etc. So let me show you the way this works since you're not going to be able to see how this particularly operates way back there in the back. Just this morning, I, I took captures of my screen on my phone whenever I was testing this out. But like I said, I just trained a very basic model to recognize apples, oranges, and pens, and deployed it in an offline scenario, as you can see here, from these arrows, not connected to the internet, not connected to a network of any type, and still being able to recognize that data. Like I said, very good for niche endpoint scenarios where we're out in the field, we may not have network connectivity, things like that. You know, we're not operating at just the Azure level, but also being able to use these tools, services that we're talking about in Azure to be able to create edge endpoint scenarios that are really useful for our customers. So like I described, we have a lot of customers that are already using the translator service for a lot of different use cases. But uh, one of the customers that I wanted to point out here is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. 
They actually worked with uh, one of our other TSPs recently to really do a, an interesting uh, scenario for a use case that they have where they have a bunch of dredging operations out along the coastline. And as you can imagine, with any type of river basin or even along the coastline, there's typically a lot of sediment that builds up, especially around the uh, mouths to rivers and things like that. And we need to be able to keep those dredged for you know a, a lot of different scenarios, things like ships to be able to pass through safely or just to ensure that you know wildlife or the habitat itself is, is not destroyed by the sediment coming down the river. So they have a bunch of barges right now that basically go out and collect all this uh, sediment that's out there and they have a lot of sensors that were you know reading information about uh, different elements that are occurring on the ships everything from the sediment level on the barge itself to you know how much water is in the tank that it's holding things like that and they need to be able to report on that real time and uh, what our other TSP did is he created a scenario where it did not involve an interruption of the service, of what they're doing right now, what they're billing, their reporting, and everything else. What they did is just a hot, uh, hot bolt-on to everything that they have within their existing operations. As you can see here from the screen, you know they were doing a lot of reporting from their Oracle backend. Um, they had a lot of processes that were going on internally. And basically what they did is took IoT Hub, stood this up, and fed data through IoT Hub so that they could also essentially deploy a Lambda-like scenario, if you all are familiar with that, being able to report on hot data as well as being able to do your typical archive operations, things like that, behind the scenes. And as you can see here, they're feeding it through IoT Hub at this time. They literally just made a small change to the API, the way that their data was being reported, to be able to dual stream it in two directions at once, and then simultaneously be able to use Power BI, uh, a SaaS service to be able to report on information real time. And then uh, one of the reasons why I brought up the custom vision API was because they're actually going to be using this in the future once they get IoT Edge deployed to be able to take um, custom imagery to be able to recognize things like ferns or wildlife and things like that and report on it at the edge. Because one of the things that they're seeing right now is that they just have a lot of uh, data that's being pushed over the wire. It's really expensive, so they want to be able to look at edge scenarios, IoT Edge, for instance, to be able to do some of that processing on the ship itself. So lastly, I know I'm a little bit over time here, so I just want to jump into some learning resources. I know that you know we've already hit on Build, Ignite, what they are. I also just want to mention that a lot of these videos that you'll see um, content that's related to Build and Ignite is also available online, so you can go back and take a look at previous sessions that have occurred to be able to get that content as well, and then be able to even look at a roadmap. Um, so, you know, check out some of that information from Build, Ignite. I don't worry about snapping photos. I'll actually post this out to LinkedIn, so if you just want to follow me out there, I'll take care of it for you all. <laughs> And uh, you know we have a lot of other good information um, along the lines of training, free training that's available through AI School, as well as edX and other avenues such as LinkedIn Learning. So, you know, lastly, you know, just be sure to check out some of this information. If you have questions, concerns, or you want to bring us into an account space, um, you know, my team is always willing. With uh, my manager back there in the back, you know, we're always willing to go out and. Uh, go into customer scenarios, perform workshops, hackathons, help get people trained. You know, we also have the fast track team back here in the back. You know, check them out as well for other types of scenarios where, you know, they can support uh, click through over the phone, things like that. So if you have any questions, feel free to ping me. And then uh, lastly, I also wanted to do a shameless plug for one of my colleagues in the back. He has an opening for the Microsoft Technology Center. Um, he had mentioned that uh, you know, it just opened up a new rec, and it's really an uh, interesting type of position that involves a lot of development-related opportunities. So if you're interested, talk to this guy David here in the back in the blue coat. <laughs>